All right, well, I'm the last one. I hope that you guys don't, don't fall asleep, because I want to tell you about how much I like cooking. Uh, it's, it's my hobby, all right? So actually, one of my special abilities, it's uh, chopping veggies. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good at that, actually. So I can chop them pretty fine, just like can go forever. <laughs> um, but as a hobby, I have I have another hobby, which is particle physics. So I wonder sometimes how much farther can I go in this process? Well, I'm not the first one who wonders about this. So already the ancient Greeks were all day discussing about whether matter or things were made of a continuum material, and then I could be cutting those onions forever, or uh, they were made of like elementary little pieces which are indivisible, so we would reach a point where we will, wouldn't be able to cut more. Well, it happens that after 5,000 years of research um, only, we got to the conclusion that the second people were right because everything is made of elementary particles, which are the building blocks of the universe, indivisible. So take ordinary matter, like this stage, a chair, like your grandpa, whoever, like, they are all made of atoms, right? You have, a, you have electrons, which are indivisible. They, they are elementary particles. And you have the nuclei, which is, if we zoom into the nuclei, we would see that they're made of protons and neutrons, which are not in, uh, elementary. They are made of quarks, which are elementary. Uh, and this is true everywhere. This is true everywhere for the ordinary matter, except in, in Berkeley, because this is a nuclear free zone, so we are just made of electrons here. There are no nuclei. Um, all right. take. So now take, um, take our particle, elementary particle lists, electrons and quarks, all right? But I'm, I'm here today, as you have seen, to talk about neutrinos, which is my, my favorite one. So neutrinos are, well, they have no charge. Uh, they are neutral. And they are also very small. They're, they have a very li little tiny mass. In order to show you how, how tiny they are, uh, I'm going to perform an experiment here. You guys are going to see how a how postdoc does research in the 21st century. So, um, Alexa, uh, what is the mass of a neutrino? A neutrino's mass is 0 0.0001 ounces. All right, so neutrinos are pretty small. You got it. Uh, but size doesn't matter, right? They compensate by being everywhere. Uh, they are created in power plants. They are created in the atmosphere. They are created in, on Earth, uh, in the sun. They are created in galaxy cores. Uh, they are created in supernovas. And they are created also in the Big Bang. So actually, if you sum everything up, neutrinos are the most abundant particle, massive particle in the universe. There are more neutrinos than quarks and electrons together. So this is uh, an excuse already to study them, right? Uh, but if there, are, if there are so many, uh, why don't we see them? Well, the, the trick is that electrons have, uh, sorry, neutrinos have this property, which is that they barely interact with matter. They're a little bit asocial. So uh, they go through trillions of Earth without colliding at all. They don't stop and they don't do anything. But uh, I'm here today to talk about an interesting property of the neutrinos, which could be linked to, with uh, another question that the Greeks might, might have uh, 5,000 years ago, which is why there is something in the universe instead of nothing, or how is it possible that we exist? Well, probably the Greeks were attributing all this to gods. Uh, I'm going to attribute this to uh, neutrinos, which are my heroes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about th the property of this neutrino. Um, so in order to illustrate this, let's uh, take a look to the sacred text. Um, well, I, I meant my secret texts, uh, which are coming right now. Uh, so I'm going to, I mean, uh, I think that all of us have some uh, background on particle physics here, so I'm going to just ram into the topic. <laughs> so this is the Lagrangian of the standard model, right? We can uh, expand it. Then we can write all these Feynman diagrams that leads to the cross-section, uh, including neutrino uh, I mean, if, you got, if I'm going too fast, just let me know, OK? <laughs> let me finish the. You guys don't? All right, well, let, that, that's fine. I mean, it, this is Berkeley. I thought people were going to be ready. Uh, <laughs> Let's go back to uh, Greek mythology. Greeks thought that there were good gods and bad gods, all right? Particle physics, we have uh, something similar. We have matter, and we have antimatter. So antimatter is just matter, but with the opposite charge. So 
we already know what matter is. Uh, matter is composed by these three elementary particles, which I have shown before, electrons, quarks, and neutrinos. So they are going to have their counterpart, which are positrons, anti-quarks, and anti-neutrinos, right? So now, this is very important. We, all the processes that we have observed in nature, or the physics processes, create and destroy the same amount of matter than antimatter, all right? The problem is that look around you, look at your chair, look at this stage. Look. I mean, obviously, we are made of matter. Where is the antimatter? Where did it go? We don't understand that. There must be a process that we have never observed before, which is creating more matter than antimatter. This is what we are looking for. Um, so what is this process? Well, take radioactivity. So radioactivity is when you have a nuclei, which is unstable. And for instance, it can emits particles. So in this case, this is a very common process in physics, which is called beta decay. You don't care about the name. But it emits an electron and an anti-neutrino. So this is one particle of matter, another particle of antimatter. There is a balance. No surprise here. It's true so far what I've said. Now we have two. Two particles of matter, two particles of antimatter. Great, we're geniuses. We can, we can sum, right? But now this is getting interesting, because in principle, this could also happen in theory, which is that the neutrinos annihilate with each other, and then you only have the two electrons, meaning that you have two particles of matter and zero of antimatter. We have never seen this, but this is very interesting because this could be unbalancing this equilibrium, right? So this is the process we are looking for. But the thing is that for this process to happen, the neutrino and the antineutrino need to be the same particle. So this means that the this property of the neutrino which is chargeless, they, they, they have no charge, so this is the only particle that can have this property, might be leading to this imbalance. So this is the process that we want to detect. The problem is that if you had these two nuclei sitting on a table and you stir them, uh, you have uh, to see this process, you have to wait 10 to the 25 years. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this number, probably because I, I'm not a native, uh, but I can give you scale. It's uh, the age of the universe is 10 to the 10 years. Um, I mean, we are, physicists are pretty patient, but we are not immortal uh, yet, yet. So uh, we don't want to wait that much. So how do we detect this? All right, I'm going to tell you how our experiment does it. <clears throat> there are many others. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you why mine is the best. So first of all, the experiment is in Canada, uh, which in case that you're not familiar with this country, is like America, but with Mantis and uh, same president. And then <laughs> what we, we need to, so first of all, uh, you don't see them, but we're continuously blasted by cosmic uh, showers. So we need to go underground, because otherwise the detector, the particle detector, will be blinded by this. So we're going to go to a Canadian mine pretty deep underground. So we take this elevator with the miners into an active mine in order to build a particle detector. We're going to go pretty far down, two kilometers down, in order to build this detector that I'm showing here, which is called Snow Plus. So the first thing that stands out is pretty subtle. So this is the main advantage of this detector. I'm, trying, I'm going to try to explain it so that you understand it. So it's a... Um, if uh, the slides, uh, so it, it's pretty big, all right? It's pretty massive. That means that you can actually fit a lot of material in there. So you don't have to wait 10 to the 25 years. You just have to wait five to 10 years in order to be able to say something, which is still a lot. But I mean, it's feasible at least, right? So how do we see this process? Well, we have to make a little cocktail here. It's uh, almost nine or 10, whatever, so I'm getting thirsty. So first of all, what do we need? Uh, we need a little bit of tellurium. This is what we put in our detector, uh, if, the, if the clicker allows me to do so, uh, which is a radioactive material, which is potentially the one that undergoes this process that we are looking for. In order to see the physics processes, we're going to put also some glowing liquid in there, all right? And we're going to uh, shake it. No, we like it shaking, not stirred. And we're going to fill it to the top. Um, so just caveat, guys, if you're a bartender, don't try to prepare this cocktail. It could be a little bit dangerous, all right? Uh, and once we feel it, we can start looking for this process. So, so a little reminder, this is what we are looking for, all right? It's creating two electrons and nothing else. So what's going to happen here? Well, we put this a glowing liquid in there, which is going to create flashes of light because of the, the charge of the electrons. And then these flashes of, flashes, of, uh, flashes of light 
are going to be detected by the 10,000 photosensors that we have surrounding the volume. So for every physics process, we're going to have a flash of light, which we're going to see. So this is kind of like this. So this is how the data would look like, actually how it looks like at the detector. So every single one of those flashes uh, might potentially be a physics process. So now the challenge is actually distinguishing which one is ours. So uh, th this process we are looking for comes up very specific energy, and there are many false positives, so this is still very challenging. But if we find these guys, we are going to party. Uh, I'm not going to dance, I'm sorry guys, already someone did it. So, yeah, that's me. So why do we do this? Uh, why is this so interesting? Well, first of all, it's pretty fun. You get to go to a mine, you get to go to in an underground lab, uh, you can play with a detector. Uh, what else? You can have some romantic uh, boating around the detector as well. Uh, actually, uh, on surface, it's not that fun because it's Canada is pretty cold. But anyway, so seriously, why are we so interested in this? Well. Remember matter and antimatter. When they encounter each other, they're going to destroy it. So if there is the same amount of matter and antimatter in the universe, the universe will be filled with nothing, just pure light. But if neutrinos are their own antiparticle, that would allow this, allows this process to exist and then unbalance this symmetry. And this would allow you to exist. <laughs> so neutrinos <laughs> are the responsible of our existence. Oh, I'm... All right. Uh, this is it, guys. <laughs> we went a long way in order to answer this question, but <laughs> I hope that in the next years we find out that neutrinos are the real golf particle. Thank you. I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you, Javier.